and we're back. So, um, so a half filled like beryllium is going to be more stable than boron because boron would love to get rid of one electron to, to be like beryllium. Okay, mm -hmm. and if you can't have a half, if you can't have a full sublevel, then you want to be something like nitrogen, which is half filled. And if they ever ask you how many paired electrons are, Julia, don't be fooled. Okay. If you have something like this, they say, how many paired electrons do you have? You might go, oh, there's a pair, and I have one pair there, and so I should have one unpaired. Usually people get fooled by when they do something like that with oxygen, because they say, oh, one, two, three pairs of electrons. No, you've got to do the orbital diagram because one in each house before you pair them up. So there's a pair, there's a pair, two unpaired. And typically you only look at the valence electrons. The valence electrons are all the S and P in the outermost level. Okay. So those are the ones you, you look at. And then it's basically the same thing with electron affinity. You look at the electron configuration first. And if they've got the same electron configuration, then you look at atomic radius. So like, um, like who's easier to ionize, sodium or cesium? Sodium is um, neon 3s1, and cesium is xenon 6s1. Wait, are, are we talking about electron affinity or ionization? Ionization. Oh, okay. Um, this is going to be easier to remove because it's farther away. It's in the sixth energy level. Okay. Um, but look at the electron configuration first. Um, do you need me to um, remind you how to fill the orbitals or no? Yeah. Okay. Uh, electron affinity, don't confuse it with electronegativity. Electron affinity is the amount of energy released when an electron is added uh, in the gaseous state. So if I have regular old fluorine, or monatomic fluorine, in the gaseous state, and I add an electron to become this, how much energy is released? That's electron affinity. Um, if we were dealing with sodium, it would have to, or let's just pick a solid, a more common solid. The copper, it would have to be in the gaseous state. Now you can probably figure out just from looking at this, you know, the nonmetals, or the nonmetals, they like to form negative ions. So the nonmetals, they are going to release a lot of energy when you add an electron. Um, metals, they don't want to have a negative charge, so they're not going to release much energy at all. With the whole energy thing, like when it's ionization energy, and um, like you'd say, like it wants to lose an electron, then it'll be low ionization energy. But then when you're talking about ionization yeah, energy, yeah. But then when you do electron if, affinity, it's, it's high so, if it wants to. Like if it wants an, if it wants an, if it wants an electron, if it wants an electron, it's going to release a lot of energy. Yeah. Okay. If it doesn't, for ionization energy, if it it's how much to, energy you have to put in to remove it. If it wants, to, so so it's going to be low. If it's um, like, if it's easy to remove. If it's easy, if to, it's remove, easy to remove, yeah. it's the low, amount of energy you have to put in will be low. Okay. But, then, yeah, but remember, with all ionization yeah. energies, and all ionization energies, they're all positive. You all have to put you have to put in to remove an electron. Okay. Doesn't matter which one it is on the periodic table. You've got to remove. You've got to put energy in to remove it. 
Whereas here, if I add this electron, um, I get energy yeah, out. You'll get energy. Okay. okay. Now there are some of them where you do have to put energy in, and they're basically there. There are two columns: the alkali earths and the mm -hmm. um, noble gases. Because we said beryllium is stable, right? Well, beryllium does not want to do this. It really does not want to do that. So that delta H for the alkali earths are positive. Same thing for the noble gases. It really does not want to do it. Okay. But yeah, it does get a little confusing. And electronegativity is different because electronegativity is how much you attract an electron to yourself when in a bond. Kind of like who can pull the electrons to themselves with greater strength. So if you have, let's say, um, uh, carbon hydrogen bond. Uh, no, let's do carbon oxygen. A carbon oxygen bond. So like carbon is 2.5 and oxygen's 3.5. You got a shared pair of electrons in there. The oxygen is going to pull the electrons closer to it. Okay. So uh, it's not like here electron affinity is okay. How much does that monatomic oxygen want an extra electron? That's electron affinity. This is electronegativity. Is that what causes a dipole? Or um, so for electronegativity, that's what we use to figure out whether something's got a dipole. Okay. So if the difference is greater than, um, usually, if it's greater than one point, uh, greater than point four, we say you are a polar covalent bond. Oh, I'm sorry. You, I'm sorry. You were talking. Um, no. Uh, that's not, it's, it's usually not how you determine whether something's got a dipole, okay? Mm -hmm. So, uh, if it's greater than 0.4, it's a polar covalent bond, okay? But it doesn't tell you whether or not your molecule is polar. So don't confuse polar bonds with polar molecules. And I'll give you an example here. So here's carbon dioxide. Carbon's 2.5, oxygen's 3.5. It's a covalent bond. It's a polar covalent bond, in fact. So you got two polar covalent bonds here. But what's the symmetry of this molecule? Is it asymmetrical? No, it's symmetrical. So this thing is symmetrical. So the overall shape of the molecule is symmetrical. And if the molecule is symmetrical, then it's um, a nonpolar molecule mm -hmm. and would have uh, van der Waals forces. If I change this to be um, carbonate. Can you do that? Yeah. 
carbonate. There's three oxygens coming off of it. It's got a two minus charge. There's a lone pair of electrons there and a resonating double bond. Does it? Maybe not. Hold on. Uh, how about we do Just do water. So water, what makes water a polar molecule is the fact that it's asymmetrical, the mm -hmm. molecule itself. So you can have polar bonds but be a nonpolar molecule. The only time where electronegativity is used to determine the polarity of the molecule is if your molecule only has two atoms. Because if you have two atoms, you're automatically linear. So you're automatically symmetrical. So only when you have two atoms do you look at the electronegativity. Like, for example, uh, HCl. So H is here, Cl is here, 2.1, 3.0. Do the subtraction, it's 0.9. So it's a polar covalent bond. So what does that mean about the electrons in the middle here? They're being pulled towards the chlorine. So if I was going to draw my electron density, it looks something like this. Because all the electron densities pull over the chlorine. So this side of the molecule will be partially negative, this side of the molecule will be partially positive. And therefore, HCl dis, uh, ex, um, exhibits polar bonding. Okay. And that's why HCl dissolves in water. It's a polar molecule that dissolves in, in water. Um, so that's the only time that you look to electronegativities is when you're dealing with just two atoms, because it's automatically symmetrical. It's all you've got to have. Wait, so if the electronegativity difference is greater than 0.4, it's Polar and covalent. Okay. Yep. And if it's only, yeah. and if the molecule is only two atoms big, then it's going to be a polar molecule as well. Okay. This one should go the little, little yeah. like, then she goes the other way. With little the alligator mouth should go the other way. Yeah. Yeah. Because the bond's greater. I hope the rest of you watch the video to the end. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's outside of school hours, so maybe it should count. Let me just see if there's anything else in here that I really want to mention. Do you guys as far as catch his mistakes during first hour? We try. They're we not try. awake during first hour. You guys are probably too polite. Sometimes you <laughs> mention them and you don't mark them. Yeah. You know what? I do mark them then later on. I seriously do. Oh, sure. I do. There are some times where... Have you where ever thrown the party? Before? Like, yeah, no one last week. Because I did. Well, when oh. Cam, he, he had me. Uh, I'm going to go. Okay, let's make it 2,000. Yeah. You should just throw the party because we're a good class. You are a very good class. What would you do if we didn't show oh. up to class the after the AP test? I mark you absent. What are we going to do in class that day? Uh, we will do something You'll, in You class won't be in that, but like, but you're not the AP be test will go until like, fifth hour. You're excused yeah. in fifth hour. Oh, okay, never mind. But, uh, uh, one last thing and then we'll be done. Uh, pi bonds and, um, <laughs> I'll do this quick. So, remember, double bond is when you have sp2 hybridization and you're going to have one single bond and one pi. If you've got a triple bond, 
you've got sp hybridization, one sigma, and two pi's. Okay, so um, the exception to this is if you have two double bonds in a row, that's the same thing as a triple. So if I had this molecule, you to tell me the hybridization on each of the carbons. So that's a double bond, right? That's sp2 hybridization. That carbon's got a double bond. sp2 hybridization. That carbon's got a triple bond. sp hybridization. That carbon's got a triple bond. sp hybridization. What about that guy? sp3. sp3. 